week eight USFL power rankings. All right. I want you to start it with this. The South is 13 and three against the North. All those jokes that I want to make about the South that I know you made about the South, but you can't because you ain't got this microphone and you ain't on the Twitters, but you can't get fired. Like I can get fired. I'm not going to make them. Just know that I made them too. Okay. That also means that nobody is clinched with two weeks left in the season, any of the four playoff spots, which is remarkable. It speaks to the parity in the league. It speaks to how much stronger the league is in year two as opposed to year one when it felt like we had the playoffs pretty much sorted out after week six. Now you got to play for everything. And a lot of that is because the team at number one has been doing a damn thing. Memphis Showboats, they are five and three after starting the season over. They have won five consecutive games. They beat New Jersey 25 to 16 at Pro Football Hall of Fame Stadium. They got a 100-yard rushing effort from Kareth White, who had rushed for all of 174 yards in the previous seven weeks. And Cardinal Lake's defense has been outstanding. They lead the leagues in INTs with 11 in eight games. And I think one of the things that you're going to focus on if you're watching the USFL is that Memphis is great when it comes to turnover margin. They are number one in the league at plus five. And that is the reason why they have been able to reel off five in a row while the offense is kind of sticking and starting. The defense and special teams have been coming through for Todd Haley. Number two, I got the Birmingham Stallions who have a better record than the Memphis Showboats and even beat the Memphis Showboats 42 to two. But that was then. This is now. Memphis is a different team, just like Birmingham is a different team. They are a different team in that I think they got the MVP at quarterback, right? I got to see Alex Magoo up close in Birmingham over the weekend, 24-35 for 333 passing yards with three TDs in that win against the Philadelphia Stars, 27-24. I also think I need to say this, right? That's the kind of game that I watched the Birmingham Stallions lose earlier in the year. They lost it to the New Orleans Breakers. They had the ball. They had an opportunity to go down and score, okay? They were down four with under three minutes left to go in the fourth quarter when Skip Holtz and Alex Magoo said, no, nah, we ain't going out like that. They got money on fourth and eight, and then they were able to cap that off with the, what turned out to be the game-winning score. And if you're looking at the Stars going, what else could you have done? Nothing. They made the right play, which is make them go down the field and go score a touchdown because you're up four in the USFL. That's a two-score ball game. Right, unless you're, I mean, excuse me, that's two, uh, that is a TD ball game. You got to get into the end zone, meaning you can't settle for three. And getting them into a fourth and eight, you expect to get a stop there. That's not how that went down. I also wrote a feature, well, a feature column following that game where I got to walk and talk with Skip Holtz about what it has been like for him to help raise Alex Magoo up as a professional quarterback. I encourage you to go read that piece because he revealed some things to me that I didn't know. So I'm sure that most of you might not have known them, but you should know that Skip Holtz said to me, I trust him explicitly. I think he trusts me. That's a wild thing for an offensive coordinator to say, which is I'm going to ask him what the hell it is that you want to do. And then we're going to call that because it makes me, does me no good to call you something that you don't think is, that you don't think we can run and you are not confident that we can win with. And Magoo is out there absolutely putting people on skates and winning ball games that I thought Frankly, the Birmingham Stallions should lose. So anyway, number three on the list, we got the Houston Gamblers. They're also five and three like the Memphis Showboats. They beat Pittsburgh 20 to 19 at Pro Football Hall of Fame Stadium. Mark Thompson had another great day, 14 rushes for 98 yards. He extends his all-time USFL rushing TD record to 13 in just eight weeks of play. And they needed it, right? Because Kenji Bahar, quarterback, didn't play as well as we had hoped that he would. But 2019 is not what you want to do against Pittsburgh Maulers. And yet, what you do want to do is win. And that makes them dangerous. Number four, Philadelphia Stars. Again, they lost that game 27-24 to the Birmingham Stallions. But I got to see a lot out of the Philadelphia Stars that I liked. They looked steady. They looked like they understood what the offense is supposed to do, what the defense is supposed to do. And the partnership between Case Cookies and Corey Coleman is paying dividends. I mean, Coleman had 107 receiving yards in that game on four catches. And one of those was just a sluggo where, I mean, he cooked that defensive back's grooks, uh, grits. I'm just, I, I, I look at Corey Coleman and I say, that's a first round draft pick out there. And he is playing like it. I would not be surprised to find out that he does end up on someone's all USFL team. 
Number five there, we got the New Orleans Breakers. They beat Michigan 24-20 in Birmingham. That's a game I was also at Protective Stadium for. They got a great game out of Johnny Dixon, former Ohio State wide receiver. He caught nine passes for 136 yards with two TDs. He caught both TDs and went for 91 yards in the first half alone. He co- told me that was the best game that he'd ever played in his life. And I went back to look. He's right, right? He had eight catches for 127 yards and a TD against Northwestern. That's his best game at Ohio State. And this is his best game either in college or in the pros. And he is rightfully the offensive player of the week for the USFL following week eight. Very excited for him. McLeod Bethel Thompson had a great day except twice, right? Say 25 to 34 for 328. Two of those, the twice INTs. He stared down who he was passing to. It's not like MBT to do that, but credit to the Michigan Panthers who were taking advantage of it, go down 21 to zero and then fight back. That's why they're number six on my week eight USFL power rankings. You're down 21, nothing with two minutes left to go in the first half. Most teams are going to pack it in, but the, the Panthers decided, no, 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 we ain't going out like that. They gave Josh Love and that offense an opportunity to fight back. Didn't get much out of the run game and Reggie Corbin, but they did get a lot out of the defense. Frank Genda led them with 11 tackles, two for loss and a pick. That's a dude that's always around the football with him. And Breland Speaks playing on that defense. You always have an opportunity to get back in the game. Number seven, I got the two and six Pittsburgh Maulers. They lost 2019 in a game where all they needed was to get six in the red zone. The kicker, Chris Blewett, well, Blewett, he hit 53, he hit 54, but he missed on 41 and that was the game. Like, that sucks. It, it really does. Because if you go get six where you're still making him kick for 53 for three, you win that game. So they had a 13-0 and lead that went to 21-0 to zero and then gave it up. They also got 20-26 or 26 passing for 214 out of Troy Williams. And I think anytime you get production from the offense, you can't afford to squander it if you were the Pittsburgh Mullet just because it's been so inconsistent. Number eight, we got the New Jersey Generals, who, of course, lost to the Pittsburgh uh, – excuse me, to uh, – not the Pittsburgh Maulers, to the Memphis Showboats. But I think it's also more worth saying they haven't had a quarterback that passed for over 200 yards all season. They've had three different starters at quarterback, and they are dead last in turnover differential. It's just not like a Mike Riley team to be so poor at holding on to the football and then not to have a quarterback as that guy is an outstanding developer of quarterbacks. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.